Okay, we are all set and can get started. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, th this is a uh, meeting pursuant to the provisions of Section 94 of the Executive Law uh, and provisions of the Public Officers Law, Article 7, uh, the Open Meetings Law. Uh, it's a meeting of the Commission on Ethics and Lobbying in Government's Working Group on Legislation. Uh, we have a quorum now of commissioners uh, in combination at our offices in New York, in a space open to the public, as well as uh, in our offices in Albany, also open to the public. And with that, I will turn the meeting over to Commissioner Cardoza, who is chair of this committee. Thank you. Thank you for all attending. And I suggest that we start with uh, the draft of the items to be considered for the Commission's 2024 legislative agenda. And uh, since Emily prepared that draft, I'll turn it over to her. Thank you. Sandy, do you want to walk us through them? Uh, sure. All right. Uh, or, or Sandy. <laughs> I would be happy to do that. Uh, we, we have a number of proposals that have been advanced uh, through a combination of processes, including uh, uh, from our public hearing that was conducted uh, on March 29th. And first proposal uh, is access, accessorial liability. Excuse me, can I interrupt you? There's a, a initials, uh, accessorial liability, and I don't understand the... the yeah. And I was going to explain. Uh, and that would be under the executive law, under the public officer's law, under civil service law, section 107, the so-called Little Hatch Act, and under the Lobby Act. Uh, so the proposal would be to have a provision providing for accessorial liability uh, under each of the statutes uh, over which the commission has jurisdiction. Uh, and, and the proposal is to amend the laws to express, expressly prohibit individuals and entities under the Commission's jurisdiction from soliciting, aiding, or importuning another to engage in conduct that violates any of the provisions uh, of the state's ethics laws uh, and the lobbying laws. Uh, currently, there's no express provision to that effect uh, with respect to others who aid or importune other persons to, to violate statutes over which we have jurisdiction. Um, broadly, th this would apply uh, under both the Lobbying Act and the, uh, again, the ethics laws, the, the same level of scienter, knowing intentional, et cetera, that applies under the substantive provisions would also apply uh, with respect to accessorial conduct. Um. What would the opposition to this be, given the, that it's, in effect, already existing under other laws? Uh, well, the, the, I, I don't want to get ahead of where we are in, in, in terms of the, the breadth or the applicability. Uh, the, the issue is whether we do have, we, the Commission, have jurisdiction with respect to others uh, who don't directly commit violations of the ethics laws or the law being act, but procure violations through others. It may be an expansion of our ju jurisdiction over individuals. Uh, it would definitely be an expansion of our jurisdiction over conduct, uh, including conduct of individuals over whom we already have jurisdiction. Okay. But, but I'm, I'm not, the, the proposals have been around for a number of years. Uh, and and I will say that I'm, I'm not aware of any specific opposition that, that's ever been voiced with respect to uh, having having a, a general provision in the ethics laws, and it could be in Section 94, that would be our proposal, uh, and or the Lobbying Act to cover that kind of conduct. Has, has either House ever passed a bill? Do you know? Uh, not, not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. I, I don't. I don't know that the bills have ever been taken up. However, we would have to look back and see. They've, they've been part of 
uh, proposals going back at least to 2018. Uh, in, in my period of time with either commission, uh, uh, the proposals have not been taken up by the legislature. Uh, Avi, you have any comments on this? Thank you. Yeah, a uh, couple of questions. One is um, just this seems like one where it would be particularly where the, the details would be particularly important in the sense that um, I'd be very interested to know what kind of expansion of our jurisdiction is being contemplated. Uh, specifically, are, are we talking about including non-state government, people who are not employed by state government um, or who are not covered by our lobbying um, statutes and regs? Uh, I, I'm not sure that that would make a difference to whether I supported it or not. I just, th that seems like a pretty significant potential expansion of jurisdiction. I, I think in the case of the Lobbying Act, it, it would not necessarily be an appreciable expansion of jurisdiction. I think arguably uh, we currently have have that coverage within the ambit of the statute. Uh, with, with respect to the public officer's law, uh, it is conceivable that we would have situations uh, where there might be applicability to, to non-state officers. Mm -hmm. uh, but but certainly uh, it would uh, in, include individuals who are state officers as as defined in sure. uh, the public officers law in sections yep. 73 73a 74 and there's this and there's some other provisions where it includes the need for the CAO CAO or the designee to, to uh, attest under penalties of perjury that's a new addition, wouldn't it be, uh, as far as lobbyists or lobbyist clients are concerned? I, I, you know, I, I, I think there's a, you know, potentially a question there. In, in, in my view, that's already a requirement. But uh, Carol, do you have a comment on that provision? Yeah, sure. So, so what what we had written in here for the Lobbying Act, that the Lobbying Act sometimes is written in a interesting way um the proposal would make absolutely clear that the cao of the lobbying entity is responsible for uh the plan in the section 10 where the penalty provisions are it makes that crystal clear for the uh, penalties for misdemeanors or felonies under 10A Romanet 2. It says for purposes of this subdivision, the CAO of the organization required to file, so the CAO of the lobbyist or the client um, entity uh, is responsible or uh, uh, you know a designee. Uh, and what would be great is, and you know, again, I'm not sure that, like like Sandy said, it's not necessarily it's not necessary. It would just be a clarification if that same language would follow uh, carried through throughout the, all of the subdivisions in uh, the pe penalty section. The, um, the 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 fact that the statements and reports required by the Lobbying Act have to be signed by someone under penalty of perjury already exists. That's in one dash p. And what we would again, and I don't think this is required to be done by statute. We could do it by regulation, but in my opinion, uh, but this this just says that the pen, the statements have to be required by a person making a file, the statement or the report. And so, again, following through on the fact that there has to be somebody in, you know, with authority at the entity to bind the entity, uh, we were. Um, this is just a suggestion to clarify that that person that has to make that has that submits the report or the statement and signs it under penalty of perjury should be the CAO or the CAO designate. Now, is it necessary that we do this? No, it okay. would just be a clarification of some, you know, provisions within the Lobbying Act. That's all. Yeah, I mean, the, the point, yeah, I mean, under. Uh, one dash P of Article One 
dash A under the lobbying act, all statements and reports have to be signed okay. uh, under penalties uh, of, of perjury. So, so with respect to that part of the amendment, it would clarify who would be uh, okay. signing the, the statement. But, but currently they do have to be signed. Any other uh, questions or comments about uh, this substantive provision? Yeah, could I ask a question? Sure. Um, Go ahead. So, Car Carol, just following up on, on what you said, so, so there's already an individual penalty against the CIO or the person who files for perjury if the report is false. This proposal would, but but we we don't enforce perjury statutes, right? The the commission, right? So this would add our ability to impose fines on that individual as opposed to institutional liability on the part of their firm. Is right, that right what now, it would do? Uh, right. So, so, so the statute just sometimes could be written better, right? So the penalties are on lobbyists and clients, and that's what the statute says. So usually lobbyists and clients are an entity. So, you know, name your lobbying firm and they have a CAO who, you know, is responsible for the filing. And so this would just clarify throughout the penalty provision that, you know, the CAO, whoever is taking responsibility and can take responsibility for the um, entity is, is responsible uh, for the penalties, you know, responsible for the filings and then the penalties can be imposed on the entity. And with 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 this change, the penalties could then also be imposed on the individual. Is that right? The the individual so, CAO. I mean, currently, just just by way of clarification, commission has jurisdiction over uh, penalties of perjury and other criminal conduct in the in the sense that if if our investigations reveal that the commission by vote, uh, or in some instances administratively. Uh, can or is required to refer uh, that conduct to the relevant prosecutorial authority and or to the sure. attorney general. So, so in the, we, we do have that jurisdiction. Uh, in that sense, we don't actually prosecute criminal violations. We refer them, uh, just, you know, but by analogy to what the inspector general does when it completes an investigation. It refers matter, matters out, nonetheless, uh, they do have jurisdiction to conduct the investigations, uh, and and I think it's clear the commission does as well to conduct such investigations. Okay, uh, Carol, you have anything more to say? The camera's focused on you. That's why. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> sorry, I must be moving. Um, no, I think that's right. And, and again, I I don't. This is just a, a clarification okay. uh, of, of the penalty provision. Uh, okay. We, we Ava, already have the CIO responsible for the filing, but yeah. Ava, you have any other questions or comments? No, thank I mean, I, I support this. I, I think the answer to my question that I heard was yes. I'm not 100% sure, <laughs> but it, it's that, that, that I, think, I think that was a yes, and I, I think, and I, and I support it. So thank you. Let, let me ask a broader question. Now that I think we have a consensus on, on this point, do we submit proposed legislation with this or is it would this just be part of the whole package that we are, you know, put, submit? What, what's our next step on each of these items, uh, Emily? Do we write a report? Uh, do we have to draft, uh, ask staff to draft proposed legislation? What's the next step? Well, I defer to um, Sandy on, you know, how you'd want to approach it, but we, with our legislative package, what I'm envisioning, once we have it finalized and the commission votes on it, then we would put out a news release with it, and then we would start um, having meetings with outsider <coughs> or the groups in the legislature about what our priorities are, and I don't know that we want to do legislation for all of the items on our package. Yeah. We might want to prioritize a couple, so I would say maybe prioritize, like, the top two three um and then go from there so the goal but i don't know if be, sandy has anything to add so the goal the goal would be in effect as i see it we put together in effect the list whatever we agree upon 
we submit it to the commission for a, approval. Once it's approved, then we go to the next step in terms of how we implement this. Is that a fair way to put correct. it? Correct. Yeah, correct. Fine. Okay. So let's move on to the second item, conforming changes to lobbying act. Uh, Carol, do you want to take those? Sure. Sure. I think I'm on. So this would, uh, number two here, the second one would, this again would make sense to do. It would be a clarification. So when the legislature added clients to the mandatory ethics training, they only did so in the Executive Law 94, but the Lobbying Act already had a mandated ethics online training for lobbyists, and um, they did not, um, you know, add clients to that provision, which would have made sense. So this would do that. The other thing it would do is, uh, so adding clients to the mandatory training that's already provided for, for lobbyists in the Lobbying Act, that's number one. The other thing that would make sense, and we did this, we did this, you know, we have the authority to, um, you know, administer the training program. So we did this by regulation, but um, uh, I was just putting this more in statute so that, you know, lobbies and clients have 60 days, you know, put the deadline in, you have 60 days from first being listed on a registration to take the training. And then um, current, and, and so that would be nice to have in there, but we could keep that part in regulation. But I, like I said, I do want clients added to the Lobbying Act. It just makes sense. Uh, the other thing that would probably make sense, and I know we, I think we got some comments on this, the Lobbying Act currently requires lobbyists to take this training every three years. And since it's a biennial registration process, that's a little odd. Uh, and so I think we did get a comment at the public hearing that they would prefer it every four years. And that to me seems a little long. It would make sense to have the training every two years. So on the biennial cycle and, uh, it's an online training. It's not terribly difficult to take. I don't think it would be too burdensome. And I also think it's worthwhile, obviously, for the lobbyists and clients to be aware of their ethical obligation. So this, this would, would do that. It would just put clients in the Lobbying Act provisions that already require training for lobbyists. It would say uh, put in a 60-day deadline for taking the training, and then it would conform the renewal, so to speak, uh, of the training to two years, which would match, would make sense with the biennial registration period. Thank you. Comments on this provision? Ava? Seymour? And I, I should note that uh, uh, Chairman uh, uh, Davey has also now appeared as a commission member. Thank we you. Welcome, we welcome you. Thank too. you, Mr. Chair. Uh, any other comments, though, uh, on this item? Ava? Nope. Seymour? No, I okay. support it. <laughs> oh, I think we prove that. Move to the next one. Training non-compliance penalties for lobbyists and clients. Uh, do, you want me to, do you want me to take that too? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So that would, um, so right now without a penalty, you know, we have the training requirement. We have a, over 80% compliance and that's great. Um, but I think to get the remaining you know, to be fully compliant um, for the people who, who just aren't doing it, we, 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 it would be helpful to have some sort of penalty. And so what I thought made sense was to um, amend the statute to have, instead of like a civil penalty, it's actually a late fee, uh, similar to what we have for late filings. And it's, you know, based on a schedule. And if you're late by this number of days, here's your penalty. And if you're late by this number of days, here's your penalty. The late fee penalties for late filings, the statute provides up to $25 a day or $10 a um, day if you're a first-time filer. So it would be similar. Um, I would recommend similar language to have for um, lobbyists and clients to be compliant, that you know they have a 60-day deadline, and then we could have some kind of late fee schedule up to a certain amount per day. Uh, add that to the statute, and then I think we could get, you know, close to, you know, that, that would help us with, with getting it to a hundred percent compliance. Any other, co any comments on this one? Maybe she said this, but what's the penalty? What's the monetary amount? 
Well, we would have to, that would be the devil's in that detail, right? So we would, I'm just suggesting we would try to put it in. Right now in the statute for late fee, for late filings, the statute provides up to $25 a day. We have a late fee schedule that we've, you know, we've taken that statutory provision and our authority to administer the Lobbying Act, and we have a late fee schedule that's in our regulation that's actually under $25 a day. $25 a day would add up pretty quickly. So we have a schedule, I forget exactly what it is, but flat fee schedule. So, you know, up to 180 days is this, you know, 10 to 30 days is that. And so we would try to figure out what would make sense. And maybe it would be the same. Maybe it would be use the same language up to $25 a day. And we could have the same kind of schedule that we have for late filing or late training. Um, but that would be something we would discuss if you uh, if you approved our uh, our recommendation. We could discuss what that uh, you know up. And I would recommend the same language up to an, a certain number per day, um, similar to the late filings. Great. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments on this item? All right. I support number, it. Next number four. Uh, express individual liability for intentional lobbying act violations. And, and, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Carol in a minute, but th this is a clarification. Uh, it's been our position uh, that that liability obtains uh, under the act, but, but we think it would be helpful, uh, a helpful clarification if we made that explicit in the statute. Right. Carol, is there it, it, any more to it? This is similar to what I was explaining earlier. Um, and, and then Sandy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but how I would describe this is, um, it, you know, the, the, the penalty would be paid for, certainly not out of the CAO's personal bank account, but out of the entity, right? But the anti the CAO would be you know responsible and for the penalty, the lobbyist and client entity would pay it. But it would you know it would whoever is the CAO of the lobbyist or the client is responsible for the filing, responsible also for under penalty of perjury for the truthfulness of the filing. But also would be the person who is served, uh, uh, who who is. Um, <coughs> Is notified of the uh, any penalties we're imposing, and would be responsible for making sure they're paid. Correct, Sandy. Is yep. that the best way of putting it? I don't know. You might want to clarify that further. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, as you said, the devil's in the details. The, the question right. of, of of whether the individual, uh, the C, CAO, or the designee for purposes of the filing, uh, can be indemnified by the entity or not. Is, right. is something we have to, to work through. Uh, and it really would depend maybe partly uh, on the nature of the of the entity involved. Uh, and there could be other factors in considering where that penalty should lie. And maybe, and maybe it's a question of C enter. It's something that, uh, again, would be a clarification uh, of what we think the current law does call for. OK. Anything else? I, I, I see a reference here to see the suggested changes on the number three, but did, did that actually mean to be number one? Uh, I, I, I think the reference should be number one. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's analogous to the second paragraph of, of proposal number number one. Okay, thank you. Okay. I have a, um, can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, so just just um, following up on what Carol said, so it sounds like the intention is not that the individual would be personally liable in the in the sense that if we end our process with an order that somebody owes fees, the somebody who owes the fees, it sounds like would be the entity, not the individual. Um, so then, in what sense is the individual responsible? Is, is the idea that that the investigation would look into whether the individual had knowingly failed to commit the act, 
And if so, that individual's failure would trigger financial liability on the part of their institution? So is it sort of like culpability on the institution, on the individual part, but financial responsibility on the institution's part? Is that the idea? Sandy, I can take that if you'd like. I, I, I view it as the CAO or the designee has to have authority to bind the entity. Um, and so any filing has to be submitted by a CAO. So whoever submits that filing, there has to be someone able to um, attest to the filing that it's true and be responsible sure. for the filing. Um, there are a lot of different machinations of entities that file with us, so there are complications with that. Uh, but it would not, it has to be submitted by a CAO, signed by a CAO or the designee, would, which would be someone who could legally bind the entity. Um, and they, you know, like Sandy said, how that entity uh, pays the fine. You know, in, in a normal case, it would be paid. In your typical case, it would be paid by the entity, right? And this, but the CAO would have to be responsible, uh, have the authority to be responsible to submit that filing on behalf of the entity. So it has to be someone who, CAO, um, a CEO, a uh, general counsel, someone with, um, and we could, you know, clarify who those people are in regulation, perhaps. Um, but it would have to be someone that could legally bind the entity, and I would like to clarify that in the law. Uh, I think that would make, you know, whether we have to do it is, you know, I don't think we have to. I would think it would be helpful um, to clarify that in the law uh, specifically because there is a provision that clarifies that for the criminal liability, and I think it should be carried forward through all of the civil penalties that follow for knowing and willful, you know, false filings, um, failure to file, all of the civil penalties that can uh, occur unregistered lobbying, things like that, that can occur with lobbying. Sandy, perhaps you could clarify that further if I didn't handle it properly. No, I, I, you, you have handled it, it properly. Okay. Uh, and, and, and the two are not mutually exclusive. Liability of the entity and liability of the, uh, of the individual who's making the attestation are not necessarily uh, uh, mutually eliminating. Uh, it could be one or the other, or it could be both, depending on the, on, on the nature of the facts. Uh, right, the structure behind the lobbyist or, or client, uh, correct. You know, precisely, and, and, and what the attester knows or, or, or didn't know at the time, and whether they were reasonably relying or unreasonably relying on information coming uh, from, from the entity. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it would be a function of where the investigation went. So it would be a factual determination made. In, in terms of the, the other proposed amendment in, in uh, uh, Section 1 of the proposals, uh, the respect of culpability for, for making false statements, that continues to be uh, subject to criminal penalties. We investigate, the Commission investigates, but then makes a referral. Uh, and, and, and there it would be, again, a question of the knowledge that the individual testing uh, has. Uh, excuse uh, me for interrupting. Uh, well, I just got a text from, from Len Austin asking, can we hear him? So he must be trying to uh, uh, speak. He's, he's muted, apparently. And he's muted, so I don't know who should be. He can unmute. So. Len, can he's got you, to unmute. Len, if, can, if you can hear me, will you speak up? I'm mute. Len? Emily, can we unmute from our end? Is that I don't know that we can. Jean, can you try unmuting Chair Austin? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yep. All right, I was just sitting unmuted, <laughs> apparently. Well, that's uh, your loss. Um, <laughs> if I may, since I've been, try I've been trying and not figured out how to get into talk, with regard to number four, how does that impact? How does that impact with the accessorial liability? Carol? 
not, again, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, and it would be dependent upon the facts. <clears throat> okay. So, so co conceivably, both provisions, in theory, uh, could apply in a given situation. Okay. Sand Sandy or Carol, what, what I didn't understand is, I heard you, I mean, the, the item says express individual liability of CAOs, but I also heard you say that you didn't envision the CAO paying the fees or whatever out of penalties out of their own pockets. And those, those two statements seem at odds to me. So I was just wondering if you could clarify. I mean, Sandy or Carol, does that make sense? Yeah, discuss that. You want it, me to yeah, it? again, let, let me say, I, I don't see this as, as mutually exclusive. Uh, so it, it, would, it, would, it would depend upon the fact pattern. Uh, the, 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 the statute does require, the, the lobbying act does require C enter uh, for, for the penalties uh, to apply, the statutory penalties. Uh, typically for knowing and willful violations. So there, there would need to be a factual assessment made as to where that kind of culpability lies in a given situation. I, I, I think, think Len, Commissioner Ayers. I'm sorry, this, Len, Len sorry. I think wants to speak. Len? No, I, 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 did, I wasn't raising my hand. No, I, I wasn't, uh, on, on that, I wasn't looking to speak. Okay, uh, Seymour. I, I, mean, I, I don't want to speak for Commissioner Harris, but I think what she's asking is whether we want to hold the individual personally liable or just the, the organization or the agency. And do we need to define, decide that and define that in, in our proposal? And, 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 and we would, to the, to the extent we're talking about penalties that the commission is meeting out after, after going through, you know, the appropriate uh, factual determination, legal determination, the hearing process. Uh, and, and as I say, I, we, we, we're not suggesting that we would be altering the Sienta requirement that's in the statute, uh, talking about the lobbying act, uh, the idea that uh, for the penalty to apply, the violation has to be knowing and willful. So both of those have to apply. And it would depend upon whether that kind of fault lay with the individual who's making the representation under penalty of perjury uh, or with the entity or both. Uh, and I think that would be part of the assessment of whether the, the penalty applied to the entity or to the individual. Well, so the individual factual... could be held personally liable is what we're saying. You could be. Yes, yes, yes the, the okay. individual could okay, be. Thanks. And, That's the answer. and this, this, is a clar this is a clarification. I mean, I, I, I think that is the situation now uh, under the statute, but we think it would be beneficial to clarify okay. that that indeed is, is how the statute works. Uh, and and per perhaps we would add regulations. Well, Let's given the these questions that seem to pervade a number of these, would it be useful to add in a sentence in the in this basic document that would explain that, it, that it would be up to the commission to decide depending upon the facts in effect uh, and the regulations that, would, that we would promulgate uh, to, set, to set these issues out. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. To avoid these questions. Okay, anything else on number four? No, with that understanding, I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, please don't hesitate to suggest. That's what we're here for, to <laughs> suggest. And number five, clarification relating to late fee penalties. Uh, Carol or Sandy? So this is, again, a clarification that I don't think is necessary. Um, however, um, some of these proposals are just, you know, things that would be nice to have in statute. So we already have uh, authority to impose late fees. Registrations have to be submitted. Registration amendments also by statute have to be submitted within 10 days of the change. And we have authority to 
you know, um, uh, make the forms that, that registrations and registration amendments are submitted under and our authority to administer and enforce the Lobbying Act. And, you know, I could go on and on about our authority here. This would literally just be a clarification. I, um, our regulations all, uh, already firmly and clearly uh, state that registration amendments um, are subject to the late fees. Uh, provided in regulation that emanate from the statute. So um, we already we already we already do impose um, late fees on registration uh, registration amendments. Uh, this would just clarify it even further in in the statute, like more specifically, I should say. But it, but I I'm 100% confident we have the authority uh, to do this, and this is something that we already do and our regulations are very clear on this. So this would just be a clarification, um, not necessary, just a clarification. All right, any other comments on number five? So breathe it. Makes sense to me. Okay, well, uh, Carol in particular, thank you for putting this all uh, uh, together. And I assume we don't have any dissent from uh, uh, from these. No. Um, so let's move on now to the uh, ethics uh, provisions, um, post financial disclosure. Uh, Sandy, Car uh, uh, Seymour, but I'm not sure who who wants to speak on this. This, this is a proposal that has come from uh, a, a number of the. Uh, watchdog groups, particularly NYPER and named in Albany, uh, and, and it's simply to create a parallel. Currently, we post the financial disclosure statement, we're required by statute to post the financial disclosure statements filed by elected officials, by members of the Assembly, the Senate, uh, and the four statewide elected officials. And this is a proposal to also uh, post the FDSs that are filed uh, by candidates for those offices. Uh, and this relates to something because I think when, when the communications committee looked at this, we were concerned that we would be imposing uh, an additional burden on staff given the ITS problem. Um, and Emily I, was sort of the point person to check, checking this out. And I gather the conclusion from the staff was that effective in 2024, this would be doable without too much difficulty. Is that is that a fair statement? Emily? For the general election. I just want to clarify that. For the general election. So after we know who the final candidates are, um, we would do that for the general election. Well, shouldn't that be noted in here? Yeah. Yeah, it's noted under yeah, staff feedback, yeah, so but I can yeah. note it under the proposal. Yes. Sure. And you meant gen general election as opposed to primaries? Correct. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. Any uh, comments? On number six, just, just sorry, just really briefly. I mean, this seems like a good idea to me. Um, do we? But we, it's it's folks's view that we need a statutory change to be able to do this. Is that correct? It, it, it may be a little bit of belt and suspenders, but but the, the, because the statute is affirmative in requiring that that those of the electeds uh, be posted. Uh, and is silent as as to others. Uh, I see. Conceivably, yeah. that that indicates a legislative intent that those are the ones, yep. not us, that are posted. Every, everything is available uh, on request, so records access oh, I see. Request, well, requests can can be made, uh, so see. they do become accessible. Uh, the candidate, as well as the uh, elected FDS, is go through the LEC, the legislative. Uh, Ethics Commission first, and then come to us. So there's, there's a time lag there, but we're the entity uh, that posts for the electeds, and, and we would propose that we post these as well. Great, thank you. All right, and Len, I assume your committee may have looked at this, so please don't hesitate to uh, interject if you have anything to say on it. Uh, okay, number seven. Uh, prohibit outside income for statewide elected officials. Um, I have some questions about this. Um, are we going, I mean, this is going to be uh, quite controversial, I think, which is, doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, adopt it. Um, 
but uh, this really would be a, a significant change and in effect impose on the uh, four statewide officials uh, something that usually uh, uh, is done really by the legislature deciding uh, salaries. Um, and has the, the political implications of this and the positives been discussed in formulating the, And I see the staff takes no position. Uh, so I think we should discuss this. Isn't there currently a, a cap on the amount that they can earn? There, there, there will be a cap uh, on uh, assembly and, and Senate members. Just on the legislature, okay. On the, on the legislature, but not on, on the four statewide okay. elected officials uh, who, who come to us for outside activity approval. Uh, if, if, if they're seeking outside activity approval. But I, I just wonder, given all the priorities that we have and the controversy that this uh, provision will undoubtedly generate, um, I used to be head of the uh, Legislative and Judicial Compensation uh, Task Force, um, so I think mm -hmm. this, I can see what this would lead to. Um, I mean, I see the benefit, but I'm not sure, are we the right group to be, per and I see NYPERG, uh, but as a state entity. I don't think, Michael, I don't think that yeah. does at all. Uh, I believe that this is purely a legislative determination. Uh, it's not our jurisdiction to say who is and who isn't uh, uh, required to uh, uh, to um, have income, not have income. That's not us. Once they pass the law, then we'll enforce it. The, the ethics committee was also of that opinion. Well, if the ethics and the legal was of that. Our ethics. Yeah. So, so can I, uh, can I get in the queue when there's a chance? Please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks. I mean, uh, so so a couple things. One, um, I'd be interested to know, just as a matter of of background, I think it's the 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 text here says this is recommended by NYPERG, but I know some of the other recommendations, even though they only mentioned one or two groups, were are actually the recommendation of a large number section. of groups. Yes. Um, uh, so, so this is just a, a general request, I think, to 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 have some care in the the background information that we get because I think it, it's not a major thing, but I know the duty to report misconduct is actually like eight different groups, not just reinvent Albany, and I think that's relevant for us to know. Um, I'd be interested, I guess, to know whether the same is true here, but it's not a big deal. I went based on what was um, in the summary from the comments that table that everybody got. Oh, so this is who commented it Commented to us. in the public hearing. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, this I isn't see. like I didn't do a poll with everybody. All no, I just meant, I, I looked it up online and there's letters from all the groups. Yeah, on, on so if you know things. that, that's yeah. great and we can note that. But that's different from this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, <laughs> the, the, so on the, on the substance, um, I mean, I guess. It seems to me there's there's two different issues here. One is maybe there are some things that we shouldn't take a position on because it's not our appropriate role, but that seems different from declining to take a position just because there's likely to be blowback. And I, I guess I, I struggle a little bit to find a principled reason to look at this recommendation and say, oh, that's a policy matter for the legislature. But things like accessory liability or um, individual liability for CAOs, well, those are appropriate matters for us to make recommendations on. So I guess what I'm looking for is, is anybody who can articulate a principled reason why, why this should be beyond our role while these other things on our agenda are sort of appropriately within it. I'm not saying there isn't one. I'm just, I'm just curious for folks' thoughts on that. But it, it, it's a good point. But is the fact that the, the fact that both the legal committee and the ethics committee focused on this issue and voted no on it, um, and the staff takes no position on it, I, I question whether we really should be recommending it, given the, presumably the fact that it has been debated uh, by the relevant parts of the commission. I mean, I'm, I'm on one of those committees. I don't remember a discussion of this item except to say that 
maybe I just missed it, but I, I don't remember that conversation. Seymour is the chairman of the Ethics Commission, Lens the chairman no, I'm, of the... Yeah, I'm talking about the legal committee. I, I just don't remember the legal committee talking about it. We I remember we, did, it. we punted some things, but did we? Len? Yes, we, we discussed it and we determined that this is not something that um, would be appropriate for us, a position for us to take. That's, that's you know, governmental policy. That's not for us to determine. But let, well, let me add, add one thing. Okay. It's, it's, it's yeah. a factor to consider. Currently, under our regulations, Part 932, uh, we, we do pass on uh, policymaker requests uh, and we're first line with respect to statewide elected officials' requests for outside activity approval, uh, which kicks in, in my interpretation of the regulations, actually a lower threshold than anything over $1,000. Uh, would trigger our Part 932 jurisdiction. So we're, we're already involved in, in regulating, uh, well, outside activities by, by the state elected officials. Uh, so it's something that we, we, we deal with uh, and consider to be, in that sense, uh, within our purview. Well, I personally uh, think we should not adopt this uh, as part of our legislative proposal, uh, that's how I would come out, and, and I gather that the at least the ethics commission committee and the at least part of the legal committee reached the same conclusion. So I think, in light of that, uh, it would be inappropriate uh, unless we're going to open up a debate, which I think is probably not constructive before the whole commission to do this. Uh, so I, I suggest personally that this be uh, eliminated from the uh, legislative well, proposal. But just before we do that, I mean, I, I do think it's a broad question about not just this proposal, but our approach to these in general. Do we have a principled way of distinguishing which legislative recommendations we feel are appropriately within <laughs> our it's hard to say jurisdiction because we're talking about legislative recommendations. So by definition, these are already things that we don't have control over. They're all non-laws. Um, but but I'm just curious about how folks are thinking about this. And, and you know, if everybody thinks we should drop this recommendation, that's fine. But I still think we should have a sense of, you know, when do we feel it's appropriate for us to weigh in on, Ava, on legislative recommendations? I, yeah. Ava, I think the distinction is as follows. This proposal talks about making policy. The other proposals, at least as I see them, now are clarifying and refining the, per the procedures and policies that we are mandated to follow. So talking about accessorial liability, that comes under our enforcement uh, provisions that we already have. We're not talking about adding something new. Um, and it, with regard to those who come under our jurisdiction, if they want to get out, outside income, they come to us and ask. Already. Well, I mean, I, but that's not, but that's not a, that means that the legislature has no problem with it, but we're kind of the stopgap that they've, got, they've created. I don't think saying that you, you can't go out and earn more than $10,000 is something that uh, we do. And in fact, I believe the last time the legislature got that major raise it was with the understanding that there would be a degree of limitation of outside income. Um, you know, they, they went from something like $78,000 a year to a hundred something thousand dollars a year, but they couldn't take more than X amount from outside income. So I think they've already done it to some extent. Commissioner Davey. Well, thank you. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. No, I was, I was, um, I want to say that I hear, I think I un hear and understand the point that Commissioner Ayers is trying to make and or has made, and that if indeed we have jurisdiction over any aspect of what these statewide elected officials do, it would seem to follow to me that we would have jurisdiction over whether or not 
they should be receiving, well, let me put it this way, have an opinion on whether or not they should be receiving outside income. Now, whether it's something we want to take up now or not for a variety of reasons, being practical, etc., cetera, uh, is another question. But I find it a stretch to say we don't have that jurisdiction or oversight when we already have, when we're already opining on making rulings on what kind of outside income they can, they can have. Why wouldn't a logical next step be the ability to recommend limiting that um, in any way? But, but I, I'm concerned that we were really debating something that the designated parts of the commission have already focused on and rejected, no matter what the, the merits or demerits of the arguments are. So if two committees working together, I assume, or in concert, uh, have already said no, why do we as a legislative committee to try to put a package together why do we have authority to overrule them without going to the full commission to having this specific discussion, which I don't think is a very constructive way that we've already delegate, in effect delegated this to two other committees. And I, I think that, I mean, again, I, I'm not, I don't want to speak for commissioners, but what she, what she asked was, what's the, what's the sort of guiding principle here? And so maybe what we're articulating is that the guiding principle is we've, you know, once there's been a committee review, in this case, two committee reviews and a recommendation, it's the sense of the body that we will accept those recommendations unless there's some really compelling reason to do otherwise. And that's kind of an operating principle. It may not be a, uh, a dare I say, moral principle. But and, and then we can always come back and revisit this because I do think it hangs out there. Um, as an issue begging for attention. Um, and I do think that there's probably an obligation on the part of this body at some point, maybe not now because it's not practical to do so, to take a look at it. Okay, well, um, if, I, if I could just- May, one, may, I, ask, may, may I play devil's advocate for a moment? Would it sure, be permissible no. for us to suggest legislation that makes their salary 50,000 a year? <laughs> Um, Permissible, it, it sure, would, but, but a it terrible idea. <laughs> well, if it's a I, I don't disagree. If it's a terrible idea for us to meddle with their prerogative in that direction, why would it be appropriate no. for us to meddle in their prerogative in this direction? Because it, it's not the meddling that's the problem, it's the number. Yeah. Well, let me. So I, they're the ones who have just... to face the taxpayers and their constituents. If they make the number something ridiculous, that's not Mr. that's Chair, po that's a political it's a political decision. It's all politics. I, I'm, I, I mean, will move. Well, will move to take, but we're, move to but take we're not supposed to be. Well, we have to. Wait, it, uh, can I just say one last thing before we move on? I know I know I know folks want to move on, but um, and I'm I'm very comfortable with saying if committees have already decided it decided it, we shouldn't talk about it. That's fine. I, I'm not sure that's actually what happened here. Um, and I, I'd like to look at the committee minutes because I, my sense of what we've talked about in the past in committees is we've gotten all these recommendations from the um, public hearing. And some of them were things we didn't want to act on now because they were legislative recommendations. But I thought we were punting those to later, not rejecting them. Uh, that was my understanding of what we were talking about. Um, in, when this comes up in future conversations, on the principle of the thing, in terms of this distinction between policy or politics and things that are within our authority, there I think I disagree pretty strongly. The 94.1 says we're supposed to do this comprehensive review, and in the course of that, one of the things we're supposed to address is the effectiveness of the existing laws, regulations, guidance, and ethics enforcement structure. To me, that says the legislature does want our perspective on things like why are legislators capped in terms of outside income, but not statewide electeds capped in terms of state? As Sandy said, we, we opine on these requests. They're clearly within our expertise. The fact that they are political footballs or sensitive hot topics, to me, is why you need an independent agency capable of offering a view on them. That's, that's why we add something to the conversation, not why we should stay away from the conversation. 
But that said, I, I recognize people want to move on, and I'm fine with that. Well, I, I, I think, I mean, I don't remember, I don't, I was a member of the legal committee, and I certainly don't remember, you know, the discussion. I do remember the discussion I had personally with Seymour on this issue. Um, and I just do suggest that when we look at this as an institutional matter, given where we are, um, we have delegated things to various committees, um, and uh, there's policy arguments, even if we didn't, that I would agree we shouldn't recommend this. But I think taking all that into account, I think this should be uh, not part of our legislative proposal. Um, and I, why don't we... Uh, uh, take a quick vote on this to see, in, in all due respect to Ava and uh, perhaps yeah, Fred, no, on this. let's just see where we are as a, as a committee so we can know, we can move on. And for the record, I'm sure. ex officio, so I won't vote. Okay. So uh, I can't make the formal motion, but I, I'm going to vote no. All right, I, uh, would, I would move that this, uh, this item not be included in our legislative package. Well, uh, in, second. In, in due respect to uh, to Len, I'm not sure. Are you a member of the legislative committee? <laughs> I was. I was invited. To, I believe so. of the legislative oh. committee. No, I don't think so. But I was invited to the committee, so I assume. Yes. Uh, I, Fine. Okay. Uh, so Seymour and I, I we didn't hear what uh, Ava said on. Uh, well, I, I think I'm voting against because I have a different understanding of the procedural oh. background. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. So perhaps. But as I say, I'm perfectly. I'm not mad about it. I'm perfectly comfortable moving on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we can move on uh, on that. Uh, and by and by the way, if I may, the, the legal committee did discuss this and did decide to uh, to recommend uh, not doing anything with it. Okay. So at the moment, number six, number seven is uh, is is out of the uh, recommendations. Um, number six. Number seven. seven. Yeah. Uh, now, number Then eight. there's a new version that had a different number. Well, I, number oh, seven, sorry. prohibit outside income for statewide elected officials is what I'm looking at. Okay. And I'm su suggesting that not be part of it, I think is where we are. Okay, number eight. Penalties for viola certain violations of the public officer's law, which have none now. Um, any comments, uh, Sandy? Yeah, yeah, let me just say from staff's perspective, th th this is a longstanding request. Uh, two, two of the subdivisions of uh, Section 74.3 of the public officer's law uh, do not have monetary penalties associated with them. Uh, there are employment actions that can be recommended now by the commission under uh, under the executive law, but there are no monetary penalties, uh, and that 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 has seemed out of step with the overall pattern of enforcing Section 74, which is the Code of Ethics, uh, and it is staff's pos position. Uh, and and there are other advocates out there, including from the public hearing, reinvent Albany. Uh, that suggests that uh, monetary penalty is analogous to those of the other subdivisions of Section 74.3 should apply to the uh, F and, and H violations. Uh, also, uh, uh, long-standing request uh, from staff and from watchdog groups that sexual harassment in the workplace, in the government workplace, uh, be made an explicit violation, uh, in so many words, of Section 74 of the Code of Ethics. Uh, there's, there's no question that the Commission does have jurisdiction over that kind of conduct. Uh, but we think it would be useful uh, to have a clarification of an explicit statutory prohibition with, with specific monetary penalties associated with with those violations. You know, we've, we've, we've litigated this question to some extent. Uh, and, and, and again, we, we believe we do have that jurisdiction. Uh, and the predecessor commissions have that jurisdiction. But it, be, but it would be well to have 
It's specifically set out in the statute for, for a number of reasons, in, including uh, to make it clear that that's a policy of the state, if there's any question about it, not, not just in uh, human rights law, but also uh, in the public officer's law. Okay, uh, comments? Seymour, Ava, Fred? I support it. Um, I support it. Yeah, as do I. As do I. Okay. Uh, number nine, require state employees to report misconduct. Uh, Fred, you want to uh, see? <laughs> see? <laughs> Sandy, you want to add anything to that? Uh, my, 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 my overall comment is this is already in the law. Uh, the executive law, in section 55.1, already requires uh, state officers and employees to report promptly to the state inspector general any information concerning any corruption, fraud, criminal activity, conflicts of interest, or abuse by another state officer or employee relating to his or her office or employment, uh, or by persons having business dealings with the covered agency relating to those dealings. Uh, and the penalty is removal from office or employment or other appropriate penalty. So there's already a mechanism uh, in, the, in the executive law for that. Uh, and the other penalties, uh, as they apply under the public officer's law, would be enforced by us uh, in any case. Any other? Uh, I yeah, if I, if I could, thank you. So um, I looked up the the group's memo on this, and their argument is that the state inspector general is not sufficiently independent to the governor. And so, you know, the, the, the point of this proposal is to change the object of the reporting from the state inspector general to COLIG. Um, and I, uh, I don't have a strong reaction to that, except to say that it shouldn't be both, in my view, that mandatory reporting to one en entity is sufficient. Um, but um, I was just wondering if Sandy or, or, or someone could address sort of, is it actually better to have the mandatory reporting directed to the inspector general? I mean, we investigate, they investigate. I think there's a general concern there about overlapping investigations and jurisdiction. But w why, in other words, it sounds like it's staff's preference that that res re remain the inspector general that receives those reports. So why is that staff's preference as opposed to having those reports come to us? Yeah, in, in, in the first instance, it's, it's a question of resource. Uh, set, set aside the question of duplication of, of mandatory reporting obligation uh, and the enforcement uh, of, of violations. Uh, we, we feel we do have a robust investigative and enforcement capability with, with, within the confines of our jurisdiction. Uh, and that includes referrals from agencies such as the Inspector General, uh, such as the Inspector General, for example, of the, of the MTA, uh, as, as well as from the Attorney General and other sources that, that, that do part of the investigative work for us to add uh, an additional responsibility to be front line in these reports. And we don't know what the, as we sit here now, we don't know what the volume of that reporting is to the Inspector General uh, under 55.1. To add that to, to our jurisdiction uh, would inevitably require an increase in our resources that we don't currently have. Uh, you know, in many respects, we're relying on the Inspector General, which has a far greater investigative capability than, than we do. Uh, to do to 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 vet those reports uh, and to investigate them and but, to develop the facts. But if we're p picking up this point, if we already have one group charged with that responsibility, um, why are we in effect either becoming a second group doing the same thing or replacing them? Given what you've just said. We, we're not advocating for it. I, I understand the argument uh, that uh, and, and <laughs> in the process of litigating the question <laughs> uh, of, of, of independence. independence. So I understand that, but it's a question of resource in the, in the first instance. And uh, as, as we sit here now, 
I don't I don't think we're in a position uh, to say that uh, there's an issue about how matters that are reported to the inspector general are being handled. But I'm, I'm, I'm not prepared to, to say that. that. That may be a position of reInvent Albany or, or other groups. But, but are we saying in this proposal that the authority of the inspector general to do the same investigation will be repealed or will simply be supplemented by us? If we were to support it. Yeah. Well, staff's not endorsing this proposal, right? Fair. Correct. Right. We're not endorsing it. So, we're not endorsing it. No. no. Sam. Well, I'm, I'm not clear. Well, Our staff doesn't support it. So why, why is it here? Because the Ethics Committee, I believe, referred it to the Legislative Agenda Working Group. Seymour, did you refer this to? I think we, we probably did. Well, there was another. There was another item on the agenda which Deb was, wasn't supporting. So I think I think these items of which were referred by our committees to the legislative working group. I see. Correct. Correct. Is, is that also true of the outside income for state electeds? Well, correct. So, well, yeah. that was my understanding that it was tabled for this, but so, where staff have recommended it, I've noted it, and if it was recommended by other party at the public hearing, I noted that. This was moved along for consideration by, by this group. Staff is not uh, advocating. But regardless of that, page. don't we have to say if we're going, if it's going to be supported, don't we have to add that it, in the explanation that the authority of the, uh, that we shouldn't have two entities doing this and the authority to investigate is being moved from the inspector general to us? Or would we have two different groups doing the same, eligible to do the same thing? I think it would be duplicative. If we were to support it, I think that we ought to, we would ask that the reporting be to Kolig instead of the Inspector General. But I don't think at this point that we're prepared to support this. So It doesn't sound to me, right. I, now I appreciate, Emily, what, what you, uh, how we got here, but it doesn't sound to me that we're prepared to, de uh, to recommend this, given uh, the problems we have uh, already from, from the budgetary point of view and the practical impact of saying we don't think in any event that there should be two entities having jurisdiction to investigate this. Is this something I'm overlooking? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the question is um, the mandatory reporting requirements specifically. Uh, I, I keep for my, myself, I, I don't see the need for uh, duplicative requirement of, of mandatory reporting. Uh, it would seem to be inefficient, it would be costly, and, and to move uh, the obligation to investigate those kinds of reports to, to our agency when we don't have the resources uh, would seem to me to be improvident. We would, we would need to improve, expand. Uh, our capabilities in that respect. And I, and, and I can't say that the current system uh, where the reporting is to the uh, Inspector General, from, from our perspective, is sufficient. We cannot arrive at that conclusion. Well, I think we have a consensus here that th this item 9 should be dropped from our agenda. Uh, am I overlooking something? No, could, could I just jump in? Um, I, I agree with that, I, I, just for, for whatever record there is. The, the reason I think that is that I can see a good reason why some complaints m we might want to direct to colleagues, specifically complaints about the governor or somebody else who has power over the inspector general in some, some direct way. I can understand why it might make sense for the mandatory reporting to go in a different direction, but I think we would need more work on the proposal and it's not there at this point. So I'm, I'm open to thinking about this more in the future, but um, but just simply shifting from the IG to colleague is not something I would I would support. So I support dropping it. That said, I just want to note, I, I think this conversation is clarifying something consistent with my earlier understanding that 
I don't think the committees rejected the cap on income for statewides either. I think they referred it to this committee. So I don't think we're precluded from considering it, whether it's a good idea. Clearly, people don't think it's a good idea, so I'm not pushing it. But I think I want to be really careful that we don't end up punting something and then deciding we decided against it. Um, Fair point. For whatever that's worth. Fair Thank point. you. But I think we do have a consensus here today that number this number nine should not be part of our legislative yeah. agenda. Yeah, and, and let me clarify one thing because I, I don't want to, to be a misimpression. Uh, we, we are open to any complaints, uh, and, and we encourage the making of complaints to us. We're only talking about mandatory reporting here. Uh, we, we have, uh, partly in response to some of the public comments we received, uh, we, we have uh, increased our, our presence uh, in social media. Uh, for example, we've we've looked at the website and our intake process for complaints. Uh, so I don't want anyone to think that we're discouraging the filing of complaints, regardless uh, of, of who the complaints are involved or or who the complainant is. You know, just as we're receptive to any referrals that fall within our jurisdiction, so that should be understood. Here, we're only talking about mandatory reporting and whether there should be a either a duplicative reporting re mandatory requirement. Uh, or, or shifting of it, and their staff would not support okay. uh, either duplicative or shifting mandatory reporting to us. Permissive, okay. absolutely, we accept. So I think we have a consensus on that. Yeah. Okay, let's move to the uh, last item, uh, number 10, uh, on the open meeting floor. Um, I guess on, on that one, let me uh, say... But I think it was pretty clear that we all wanted to have a, a change in, the, in that law to eliminate the physical access requirement so that meetings like this could be conducted uh, by conference call. Um, and in fact, uh, Sandy and the staff, with a little help from me. By Webex, you mean? Video. Yes, by Webex. Web, right. yeah. um, uh, Sandy. Uh, and the staff and, and a little assistance from me has been working on a, uh, a letter to the Open Meetings Law Committee, which has to report to the legislature by, uh, I guess, the end of the year, uh, uh, of its views on the various changes to the Open Meetings Law, including uh, the whole uh, requirement of uh, virtual meetings uh, expires by its terms in July of uh, 2024, so that, that you know, clearly the legislature is going to have to amend the law, and so we're uh, uh, er would be urging that uh, it, that change about having virtual meetings should be made permanent, but that you shouldn't have to have for committee meetings that are non-decisional, uh, but just advisory. Um, that uh, we don't have to have the physical access requirement uh, so that we could all have a, uh, a meet meetings like this uh, uh, virtually. Um, and when that letter is, uh, draft letter is completed, we are going to be, our plan is to circulate it to, uh, to the whole commission. So unless you have any other comments, I think, don't know that we have to have any extensive discussion of this. If, assuming I've said the uh, consensus is correctly. Could I just ask a question? Um, I'm just wondering, has there been any pushback from, uh, I mean, I know this has only been aired in public to a limited extent, but but um, are we aware of anybody expressing concerns about this? Um, the only concern I'm, I'm wondering if, if exists is about um, some provision that would require continuing to open the live, the, the in-person sites so that members of the public who don't have. That, and that's included in the last that's sentence. Included in the proposal. Require these okay. meetings to be webcast at a location the public can access without the okay. committee members having to be physically present. Yep. Okay, thank you, Emily. I appreciate that. Um, and, and we yes. hope to, we hope to uh, circulate this draft relatively uh, mm -hmm. Great. promptly. Uh, so assuming, assuming the two uh, Draftsmen who, who are sitting in this room can uh, work together on it. With it. <laughs> <laughs> we think uh, it, it should be done. Um, so, 
Uh, but I think we need to now have a consensus. Uh, so we have now, I guess it would be eight recommendations to be in, in our legislative agenda. Um, and uh, thanks again to Emily for pulling all the various comments uh, together. Um, and so uh, I think that what, uh, uh, you know, is there, are there any other agenda items at the moment that we think should be in the legislative agenda? Um, and if not, um, I guess we could still wait to, to finalize this until we have the, uh, what are we calling, the, uh, the meeting of, of all the, uh, the public meeting that we're going to have in November. The, the round table. Right. The round table. <clears throat> Uh, but and does this anyone will be on think for the October committee meeting as well? So a revised draft based on the feedback from this group will go out to the full commission for discussion at the October meeting, which oh. is going to be in advance of the meeting with um, the roundtable folks. Okay. Yeah. Any uh, other comments? Yeah. I, Any the, other comments? The, the, the issue I I raised by email whether we. Need to have a discussion about, or or have already had, and and I I had to leave, um, a discussion of whether we need uh, some kind of legislative measures during the pendency of the litigation. Um, whether there's legislative action that we want to recommend to help manage the oh, on the term term during that. that. Yeah. Is this this point of order, Mr. Chair, is should this be an executive session discussion? I'm fine with that if people want to. Yeah, that's the, why. Why don't we go so we can finalize? Want to adjourn to executive session? Yeah, I think yes. that makes sense. I think that's okay, very good. Okay. Involves litigation. Right. Okay, very just good. give us one moment. Um, sure. Gene, could you get uh, Media Services Center on the line and let them know that we will cut the live stream for executive session? Or do we have to make a motion? Do you have to make a motion uh, first? I can't. Uh, so moved. <laughs> I move that we move to executive session. Second. Okay, okay, I think we're Jane, all in favor of that. Get us into executive session. Thank you, Fred. You know, for a guy who claims he's not a lawyer, I seem to become a legal issue. I'm, I'm just a nervous <laughs> ninny. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what's at work here. <laughs> <laughs> You will be clear in five, four, three, two, one. I could be wrong. Okay. Are we live now? We, you are live. Are we? Okay. Uh, Sandy, can you uh, explain uh, what happened in the executive session? Yes. In, in executive session, uh, the committee, the working group, received and discussed legal advice as it relates to pending litigation. Okay, so now back in open session. Uh, at the moment, we have eight legislative proposals, um, and we will, uh, subject to any other changes, uh, we will present those proposals to the uh, uh, full commission at the uh, October meeting in two weeks. Um, and at the moment, therefore, there would be no other legislative proposals that we would be suggesting. Is that a, a fair summary of where we are? Yes. Um, and so, uh, Emily, will you be sort of revising this to reflect what we've done and then distribute it to the commission for discussion at the uh, October meeting? Absolutely. And can we, can we include what was rejected as well as what was included because i i think that consistent with the spirit of delegating to committee all of those decisions should be in front of the commission i can note which things um the group decided not to forward and put them at the end if you like yes the the only issue is are there other legislative proposals that we did not look at either pro or you know to to not include that were not 
covered by one of the committee decisions? Oh. I don't believe I mean, so. I believe the committees went through them all. And so, like, it, like if there was one, the committee, like the legal committee said, let's not move forward with FDSs for the judicial folks right. because that's not our area, right? So we didn't put that one on. So when there was decisions like that, I did not put them on. I just think that, so, that whatever decision we make to reject an idea ought to go up in front of the commission because committees don't have the authority to reject anything themselves. Or at least that's how I see it. I'm, I'm perfectly yes. open to So therefore, <clears throat> we know of two. Uh, right, exactly. Yep, that's all I... Are there, are there, what you're asking is, are there others? Is that right? Well, there, there, there are some instances in which uh, the, if they the proposal had already been implemented. Or has been implemented in the in the interim. For example, yeah, I don't mind about that. Uh, certain kinds of advice from agency heads have been addressed by the commission in a in a resolution. So, is it fair to say that <clears throat> these are the legislative proposals that uh, we're making? Uh, any other legislative proposals were either. Uh, Implement, in effect, implemented because we didn't need legislation um, right. or were uh, reviewed by but or reviewed by the one of the committees and, and not recommended. Correct. Uh, but, that, but then, Ava, you would say, but, but the commission hasn't itself focused on that. Yeah, I think my, my point is only if at some point, whatever ideas we, we reject, as opposed to deciding that they've already been done and so nobody needs to consider them. I'm perfectly comfortable with that. And I actually think a lot of the um, public hearing suggestions were really for staff, not for, for the full commission. But, but if it's a legislative recommendation, then I think at some point the commission should be agreeing as a whole that we're rejecting it. It shouldn't be just a committee that rejects it and then the full commission never discusses it. So, so I don't have anything specific in mind. I'm just saying that at some point rejected ideas should also be, the, the full commission should be aware of that. Uh, okay. And I, why think, we I think we have that. As, I think I think we have that here. As long as the whole list that Emily prepared, which is wonderful and really helpful, uh, goes to the group with with two of them moved down to these are things we didn't endorse. Right. I, I mean, there are other things that committees did not move forward that are not on this list because they didn't table. They didn't say. Like, I think in some of them there was consensus that they probably wouldn't move forward, but said send it to the work group right. anyway, right. Right? right? But there were others that were like, no, we're not moving forward, no, we're not moving forward. Those are not reflected. Right. I'm just, that's just the point of clarity. May I ask your question, please? Right, we, we, we can work back through those and, and uh, tie them back to uh, the actions uh, of the various committee or the recommendations of the various committees. That, that's quite doable. Yeah, that's yeah, and and I do what? have a list of what those are. Okay, I okay. just don't have the reasons added in. Yeah. Um, uh, see, do we make do we make these suggestions of what for legislative action as a bill from our committee? Do we find uh, members of the assembly and senate who would sponsor it, or would the governor put it forward as a program bill? I, I couldn't hear you, Lynn. Can you repeat that? I think the I'm question sorry. was, would we move these to um, an assembly or Senate committee for possible putting forward the bill, or would it be a governor's no, 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 program no. bill? Was that the well, do, we have to find, do we have to find sponsors from the House, from the Assembly and the Senate to pursue these bills? Do we, um, do we have the power ourselves, and I don't think so, to introduce the bills ourselves? But, as a sort of program bill, or will the governor take our suggestions and put them in as program bills? That, that's that's to be determined. Once once we once we settle on the commission settles on the legislative agenda, then um, the preliminary plan is is to discuss those proposals both with the chamber. Uh, and with the relevant uh, committees in the legislature. But I, I, the question is whether we're not going to have it on our legislative agenda, but do we nevertheless uh, discuss potential issue A with the Assembly or Senate? Yeah. 
and we could decide that down the road. Yes. Right. See what you want to add. No. Okay. Thank you. I, Frank? I, I'd just like to address this issue of proposals that <clears throat> were made that committees set aside that never made it to the legislative committee, and then the proposals that this legislative working group uh, has set aside. I think there should be a, a list of all of those that come as a re part of the report of this legislative committee. That, you know, here's what we're recommending, here's what the committee's recommending, and, and here's what we're recommending in terms of the way to proceed on each of these. Here's are the ones, here are the ones that the committee set aside, and then here are, here are the additional ones that the other committees, whether it's ethics committee or legal committee, also set aside. That's fine if we, is that doable? Um, I guess yes. I'm asking Sandy and, and uh, Emily. Emily said yeah, we, yeah, yes. We, we have all of them. I, okay. I think that's something that we had planned to do anyway. Okay. But we had gotten, we got side, no, I shouldn't say sidetracked, right. but there were some intervening events which right. changed our focus. Yes. Yeah, right, right. What, what, yep. You want to elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so uh, perhaps, Thank you. Emily, if you could uh, send me a draft of, of this additional provision, or, or Sandy, um, I can take a look at it before we submit it to the full commission sure. uh, in advance of the October meeting. All right? Great. Well, thank so you so I, much. And, and since I have to go, I just want to say thank you the, the, um, to, to Emily and whoever else worked on this. The, the materials were super, super helpful, and I really appreciate everybody. And, and also, Fred, thank you for, for what you just laid out and requested. I think that'll really help all of the members of the commission feel included, and I think we're all, we're all conscious of the need to do that. So I, I really appreciate everybody going along with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you. And I also want to thank the staff and Emily for all the hard work that was done here. Uh, I want to I want to reiterate that as well, um, but the good uh, but the, the, this is only item one of our agenda. <laughs> uh, so I think the uh, uh, let the, the uh, revolve rotate whatever we're calling the uh, the meeting round table round table, round table meeting. Uh, do you want to give us a little introduction, uh, Emily? As to what that is. Sure. So um, we will be holding a roundtable with um, some stakeholders to get their feedback um, on the legislative proposals that the commission agrees on. We will also be providing them with an update on actions that we've taken since um, the March public hearing, which may be legislative or not. Well, many of them are not legislative in nature. Um, and then um, we will, like I said, have the discussion about the legislative agenda to get the feedback and then use that as we develop our final legislative agenda. I, I would emphasize in connection with the actions we've taken uh, since the public meeting and before this one, uh, the various things that we have implemented, uh, adding things to the website, things that we can't do this year but we'll be doing next year, uh, I think it, it will reflect favorably on us that you didn't need legislation, you didn't need it, you, were, you gave us a lot of suggestions which we simply could implement. And I think the more detail that you and the rest of the staff at the meeting can go into in that respect <coughs> would uh, make answer any questions that people might have is why you only have eight legislative uh, proposals. And what we're really saying is probably we had another eight or ten proposals uh, that we were able to implement without legislation. Um, yeah, and if and you want me to, I can go and. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I thought you were. No, go ahead. I was just saying, if you want me to, I can talk a little bit more in detail about item by item on the agenda the, that we have proposed for the roundtable, which might fill in some more information sure. go ahead. about that. So. Um, the welcome and introductions would be um, by Chair Davey or Vice Chair Austin, depending on who's in attendance that day. Um, and then we'd go around and have all the roundtable participants, including staff and commission members, and the participants just introduce themselves so we all have names and faces. Then um, 
I, Sandy and Colleg staff will give a, a PowerPoint presentation by area. So like Carol will do lobbying like she did for us that one day, like here are the things that we've already implemented, open data um, New York is up, we have the hopefully the um, registration term button ready to go, like some of the comments that we've already addressed, gone through that and we'll go through each section so that everybody gets that history. Um, then, and that, that will be like adding things to the website as well, Commissioner Cardoza, like you mentioned. Um, then we'll go into doing, in um, this is a point for discussion, whether commissioners or colleague staff would want to go over the draft legislative agenda. Um, and my thought is that we get through the whole agenda in a presentation format. Again, we can have a PowerPoint with the idea. Um, and then we discuss it. We have an, about an hour and 25 minute discussion with all the roundtable participants so that they can give us feedback on the various proposals. Um, and then we'll have closing remarks just by um, Chair Davey and Executive Director Berlin, just to wrap it up. Just a question then on that. So on the things that we simply have implemented without the legislative agenda, will that be the subject of discussion or will that end up sort of at the end of the discussion? No, that's at the beginning. We're doing that PowerPoint where staff are going to go through, here's the things we've already done based on what we heard. You know, here's what we heard at the hearing and here's what we've already done to address that. So stuff that we've done or in the process of doing maybe, like we haven't done it yet, but here's an update. We're in the process. That will all be at the front end. And then we'll go to the legislative agenda proposals and then discussion. That's sounds correct. Uh, so I'm going to uh, just, we have a issue we need to talk about, like right now. So can An we, session? yeah, can we take another, sure. something just uh, transpired? Sure thing. All right. Sure thing. Hold on one moment. I move that we go into executive session. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we need a second from. Oh, well, so it's here. Oh. It was down here. We're getting Media Services Center on the line. Just hold one moment, please. Now you're, you're on. You're you are on. Live. Okay, you want to distribute? Yes, in, in executive session. Uh, the committee, the working group, uh, discussed legal advice regarding pending litigation. Okay. So we were in the middle of discussing uh, the roundtable uh, meeting. Um, we went to executive session. So, uh, Emily, you want to continue your report? Sure. So um, I had just finished going through the more detailed discussion of the agenda for the roundtable. So did anybody have any questions about that? Well, I, I did have it maybe to fit into this or not. I'd like to go over the pension invitees uh, that you sent us. I believe list. that's next. Yes, that's next. I just want to make sure no one's got questions on the agenda. Then we can go through the invitees. But if no one does, and we can move right well, well, Emily, well, Emily, well, yes. will the uh, invitees be uh, given an opportunity to present um, written uh, material to us in advance of the roundtable? So <laughs> they would probably do it after the roundtable, given that um, our meeting is October 27th. So we have right. to finalize our legislative agenda, um, put together the materials for the roundtable based on that. Then um, probably the day before the roundtable, we would send them the legislative agenda um, with, and the agenda for the roundtable. And then I think we would welcome them to submit additional comments in writing after the roundtable rather than in advance. Because I just don't think that okay, the time. Okay, thank you. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask uh, Emily. Uh, first of all, uh, you, you're missing a name for the State Bar Association, uh, and I would think the former president of the State Bar Association is sitting in this room and should be able. Sandy to, actually uh, gave me a couple names, oh, um, okay. which are related, and I just want to give a preview a little bit on the sure. invitees before we go through the list. Sure. 
So what we did was um, we went through people who are um, who submitted public comments that will be on the legislative agenda, right? And we said, okay, let's make sure those folks are in the room because we're talking about the legislative agenda. So we added them. Then we also added folks who have frequently provided us public comments on other things that we have sought public comment on. For instance, our draft regulations, like our foil regulations and the other regulations um, that we have done um, since COLEG has been formed. So those, those are people who are frequently providing us with feedback. Um, and then we also added, um, like you said, the New York State Bar, Oce Bar Association and the two names Sandy gave me there um, was Lisa Cobb, who's the chair of the local state and government law section. And then um, Mark Davies, who is the co-chair of the ethics and professionalism committee. Okay. Um, that's not the, those aren't the uh, government relations folks. Because there's been a change in the government relations staff, so I'll have to get the name. Okay, um, sounds good. Um, Emily, if on some of these people, as Seymour just indicated, they're, they have a successor or someone else who's taken over. And, and on, on the city bar, for example, um, the director of advocacy you listed, which is fine, uh, but if, for example, uh, the president of the association wanted to speak or the head of the relevant committee wanted to speak, do, can we say in the uh, transmittal letter to each of these people, of course, if you want someone else to appear in your stead or in addition, can we make some reference to that? Sure thing. I just suggest that uh, uh, we, we do that. Um, we should send it to the president. Yep. Pardon me? Maybe send a to, CC to the president. Send it to the president and say the president, you are a designee. Well, that may result in non-response. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. or maybe you just send to both. Yeah. Or CC. Well, what I could do too is is send it to the president, but CC the person that we have on the list. Yes. So that okay. then it'll yeah. get hopefully yeah. some traction. Does that work? Yeah, I think uh, I think that's that's right. Um, now I had a couple other questions. Um, the one area that we didn't cover, and I understand why we didn't cover it, uh, the the alleged election suggestions that the changes in the, the election procedures, campaign finance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, should should we reach out to them separately? I mean, it's not in our legislative proposals. But we did have some potential changes. Should we deal with them in some separate way or just ignore them? Um, so you mean, okay, so I'm just trying to, are you talking about the, the, the groups that made comments about proposed campaign finance changes and yes. how should we let, let them know like that we're not advancing those and maybe refer them were somebody else they could send those recommendations to? Um, I just want to independent. I mean, is there other other areas that really we haven't reached out to people on? Um, I know we'll deal with the Grandau type issue uh, separately, but um, I can't think of another area other than the elect specific election uh, suggestions that we're not covering in one way or another. In other words, most of the suggestions came from these uh, these groups that are being invited, right? So for, yes, a lot of the legislative proposals came from um, the first four on your list. Right. Yes. Um, Along but, with other proposals they put forward. Right, right. So I guess what I'm asking is, are there other potentially serious proposals which we didn't adopt that at least we should give some kind of deference to say hey we didn't ignore you but uh, you know maybe even a subcommittee meet with that that person that elections are the ones that I just remember um, but by focusing on something that's not worth I'm, it I'm having trouble hearing I'm sorry vice chair Austin do you mind muting it's you're causing New York City to cut in and out a little bit. I'm sorry. Thank you. 
So um, I, I just I just want to we don't want to alienate anybody that's making a very good faith suggestion. And the, you know what we rejected for a variety of different reasons or not didn't include. Um, are we just yes? They can certainly all be invited to the meeting. Any this is a public meeting, but should we deal with those one or two other groups in some other way? Or am oh, I oh, open? so those weren't those weren't campaign finance related um, recommendations. I don't believe, but there's some groups that put forward comments that um, we are not inviting to the round table because they're not pertinent to our legislative agenda at this time. Right. Is that what your question is? Yeah. Um, I don't know, Sandy, if you want to weigh in. I don't, I think because we're focused on our legislative agenda that we want to have the right people on the, at the table okay. to discuss that. And if, and if folks ask, we can let them know. That's why. I, I agree. I think okay. that makes the most sense. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, now, we are going to have some people uh, who made recommendations Particularly, uh, well, two or three people we know will show up at the meeting physically because uh, it's an open meeting. And when they inevitably start saying, hey, I want to speak, how are we going to handle that? We'll let them know that this is an invite. Um, invitation speaking opportunity for the individuals in the room and that they're welcome to submit comments to us in writing. Okay. It seems uh, seems seems fine. Um, no, I think this this list looks uh, very appropriate to me. Um, <coughs> suggestions from anybody else uh, as you look at this list? Okay. Well, I mean, I know I, I know both Mark Lazen and Josh from my work with the state bar. Um, but are there other, and it's really a lobbying firm, are there right. other lobbying firms that have been submitting, that have submitted comments because we don't want to exclude others to, and include right. anyone? So I did ask, um, reach out to Carol for the recommendations on the folks from the lobbying side. And those were the two names that she gave me, but I just see Carol pop back on, so I'll let her speak. Uh, I'm going to step away for just a moment. I'll be right back. Carol? Great. So I, I recommended them as, as someone who, who um, handles like the regulated parties. So we have, I think, I don't have the list in front of me right now, actually, but that of the invitees, but I believe we have, you know, the not-for-profit and the good government groups coming. So this would be more um, representation for the regulated community, like the more typical, you, can, you know, I guess more typical lobbyists and clients. Um, and they have been, you know, when Emily asked, reached out to me, I was also looking for people who have been very helpful. So they have been very helpful to us in the past, um, you know, when we were drafting the regulations, for example, and, and, and you know, kind of like, you know, what makes sense because, you know, we can sit here and draft a regulation um, here, but like they know how it works in the real world. So they are always very helpful. Um, they've also been on panels that I've been on in the past. They, they just tend to put forth good information. So that's why I suggested having them. Right, okay. so they provided feedback that was helpful. Right. Okay. Okay. All right, any other comments on the, on the invitee list? All right. Any other, a, a, anything else, Emily, that you want to uh, raise? Just to um, let everyone know, we are confirmed for November 1st at uh, the New York City Bar Association. We're going to be um, starting at 1 p.m. And the goal right now is to end about 3.30. Um, we will be having lunch for commissioners at 4 or noon, excuse me. So if you want to get there a little early, that's fine. Um, but that's about it, all of the details, I think, at this point. Uh, and we're going to have press uh, that will release, a, you know, a press release. It'll be happens. advised like all of our meetings are. Yep, it'll be advised like all of our meetings are. Um, so I 
expect we might get a couple come in person. I um, expect more to join online um, and view the webcast of it. But yes, it is open to the press if they would like to come. Uh, well, I guess in addition, I mean, but do we want to have a special press release, um, not just you know the usual mechanical announcement of a meeting, but do we want to uh, issue a day before um, that the commission uh, has come up with a, a legislative uh, agenda? They'll be meeting with interested people. Uh, you know, just play, play up our efforts, I guess. Is, or, or do we want to so wait just? The, the media advisory was going to be a little bit more meatier than our typical meetings and, okay. and say who the participants will be and, and all of that. I would hold off on saying and announcing like our legislative agenda. We can talk, say that'll be one of the things that will be discussed because I think we're going to want to do a news release when the um, when the um, commission votes on it and approves it. So we'll have that release ready to go when the commission approves it. That'll be the full package because I don't want to put out a release on something that's not final yet. But certainly it'll be noted that we'll be discussing um, legislative agenda. And then after this meeting, w will we sort of consider whether or not we want to add or subtract from the legislative agenda? Then we'll decide that at the November meeting. And then that'll that's be what it. I was in. Yeah, that's what I was envisioning. I don't know if this group wants to meet again in advance of that, or if you just want to do it at the full commission meeting. That's really up to to all of you. Well, we don't have to do it. We don't have to make that decision to let. No, and you can wait and see what the feedback is, and then make that decision. Right. But I would just wanted to put flag that in as maybe one interim step you might want to consider. <clears throat> that's all. Right. But I think I think then we're we're clear is. That the next step is you'll re revise the legislative agenda as we discussed, um, and uh, we'll have a discussion of that at the October meeting. What is it, October twenty fourth or whatever? Yeah, we'll then have the meeting on September one, um, and then we'll decide based upon the input from that meeting what our next Correct. step is, recognizing that we should probably have a formal adoption of the legislative agenda. Uh, further adoption at the November 29th or whatever it is meeting. Right. Or it could be the subsequent meeting too. Like if the discussion at the November meeting, you know, wants additional changes and it wants to come back, we can certainly accommodate that as well. Right. Fine. And then I, I guess I would add that at some point in time, we want to discuss, okay, now we have an agenda. Now, how other than putting it on a piece of paper, how we're going to get this done, but I don't think that's a discussion for today. Correct. Okay. Uh, any other uh, business that we should come before this committee? Uh, Sandy, I, anything? I no, I, I, I think we're, we're complete. We, uh, we have our marching orders. We'll Great. follow up on that. Uh, well, I want to thank the members of the committee uh, and uh, I think that's it. I have the meeting adjourned. I, Emily, I do want to talk to you about the uh, the draft document on, on the open meeting floor. Sure, we I can, can do stay on. We'll just close out. Um, right. We'll just <clears throat> right. cut the live uh, stream the and then we can Motion check. to adjourn? So moved. It's just you and me. Okay. <laughs> and, um, uh, we just do a moment and I'll let you there. know when um, we're out. Oh, fine, fine. Okay. Thank you. Back. Back. Yeah, back. I'm here too. Okay. One second.